Glory to Christ Jesus alone. Thank you, North Region United Worship. Exactly from the moment voices coming out from their mouths and exactly the moment you touch the instruments, the musical instruments in your hands, just suddenly as if I was transported in the presence of the Lord. And I almost forgot as I was shouting there out of my lungs, I forgot almost that I will be the preacher for today. <laughs> Thank God for reminding me and saving my voice to preach before his people. And also I would like to thank this opportunity for thanking Pastor Alan and Pastora Grace for inviting me once again to see LCC Global. Seeing your beautiful faces and handsome faces. The last time I was here, Pastor Alan and Pastor Grace were in the UK for a mission and I enjoyed that time. I had the liberty. They were not around. <laughs> but now I'm try, I will try to be sensitive <laughs> of the time. Good. Pastor Alan, you assigned me, Pastor Grace, for this chapter 3 of Zechariah. It has only 10 scriptures. Verses, I mean, 10 verses. So it is short, right? And we are trying to preach this sermon series to you, exegesis, verse by verse. I only have 10 verses. So to tell you, I will try and finish it in 10 minutes before 2 p.m. <laughs> what time you finish your service? 10 hours. 10 hours. I'll get even with you, Pastor Alan. Because the last time he preached in our East region, he asked me, Pastor Renner, how much time you have all the freedom? And he the, he's the one who gave up. <laughs> but I will not do that to respect your time. <laughs> As the Lord and the Spirit of the Lord leads. Amen? Amen? So let us just bow our heads and pray for the Word of God. Hallelujah. Indeed. What a great joy to be in the presence of the Lord. And Heavenly Father, you alone deserve all the glory. You alone deserve all the highest praise. You alone deserve the highest worship and exaltation. You alone. No one else. And in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ, in his righteousness, we come before you asking you, Father God, that your Holy Spirit will be preaching and teaching us your word in the name of Jesus. We submit to your sweet and gentle voice. And I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you will help us see your word from your own eyes and hear your voice from our spiritual ears and give us your heart of understanding and the mindset of Christ Jesus as we walk on your word at this moment right now. Holy Spirit of the living God, have your mighty way in each one of us. This pulpit is yours. This moment is yours alone. For the glory of our Father who is in heaven. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen, amen and amen. Again, disclaimer. I'll try to finish it 10 minutes before 2 p.m. <laughs> so we are in the series about Zechariah. And in here, we are going to study fourth vision that Zechariah received from the Lord. And just a quick review. I said quick. And we can see in our monitor, in our screen, the last three visions. And I entitled this message as cleanse, clothe, and commission. Three letter C. Cleanse, clothe, and commission. 
the story of Joshua's redemption. First of all, let's recap or recall what we have studied in the past three visions that Zechariah received from the Lord. First is the vision of the horses. In our monitor, you can see a man on a red horse accompanied by red sorrel and white horses stands amidst myrtle tree and the angel of the Lord asked the Lord about the 70 years of punishment and the meaning of its fulf and fulfillment of it. The men walked throughout the earth. The, um, the temple would be rebuilt following the 70 years during which the temple lay in ruins during the exile. During that exile. And in here, the significance of this vision is this. Israel, the Israelites, was asking, why isn't God punishing the wicked? You remember that? Wicked nations may prosper, but not forever. We learned that in the first vision. And God, one day, will bring upon the judgment they deserve. That was the first vision. And in the second vision, we saw and, and we learned the vision of the four horns and four craftsmen. And Zechariah sees the four horns. And the four horns represent the four kingdoms which caused the scatter the people of God. And in this, what we learn, in the, these are the four empires that caused the scatter of God's people. And what we learn, the significance of this passage in here, we learn that God will do what he promised. After the evil nations have carried out his will in punishing his people, God one day will destroy those nations because of their sins. That's the second vision. And in and the third vision, Zechariah saw the vision of the measuring line. Zechariah sees a man measuring the city of Jerusalem. And in here, what is the significance? The city will be restored in God's future kingdom and God will keep his promise to, keep, uh, to protect his people. Someone asked me, Pastor Renner, what do you like if you will be asked? Vision, dreams, or prophecy? I said between dreams and vision, I'd rather choose the vision. Why? Because the scripture says, young men will see visions. If I will be dreaming dreams, I'll be old. So I said, I'd rather choose the vision. I'm young. <laughs> so in here, in Zechariah chapter 3, we will see, first of all, in the entire book of Zechariah, what the book of Zechariah trying to teach all of us. God, in his tremendous grace, sends Zechariah to call them to repentance. This is what the book of Zechariah is all about. This we learn on the first vision. And to give his people a message of his grace and promise towards them. That's why Zechariah is a message of repentance, of hope, and a warning. That's the entirety of the book of Zechariah. And in vision one, just to recap, God sees them in their mess and promises comfort for his own people. In vision number two, God will punish their enemies as they return to faithful worship. And in vision number three, God's great and gracious restoration will bring his home to him. Now in this vision of Zechariah, the fourth vision, we will see, and I believe, that this is the climax of the entirety of the eighth vision of Zechariah. You know, in Western literature, we know climax usually we will see at the end of the story. But in Zechariah, as you will see in the diagram, that's why I said of all eight visions, as the story builds up, as we know in Western literature, the climax is usually at the end, isn't it? But here in Zechariah, I believe that the climax is in the fourth and fifth vision of Zechariah. Because in the fourth that we will be studying today, we will talk about the coming Messiah. And who's that? He is Christ Jesus. 
And in vision number five, we will learn next Friday. And it is getting more exciting because we will talk the, about the Holy Spirit. But I will be talking vision number four, the coming of the Messiah. That's why the climax comes, and I believe in my heart, is in vision four and vision number five. So hold on to your seats. This fourth vision departs somewhat from the promises made by God or revealed by God to Ezekiah prior to the last three visions, which promises God will rebuild Jerusalem, the temple, there will be peace on earth, and the coming of the Messiah's kingdom. But the promise of vision number four is more internal. It is more spiritual in nature. In Zechariah chapter 3, the fourth vision, we see a beautiful picture of the Lord cleansing his people from their sins. And the Lord has given his people a great assurance. And what was the great assurance? The assurance of being cleansed from their sin. The fourth vision shows the need for Israel's cleansing from sin and the institution of each priestly office. Israel's internal cleansing from sin begins, first of all, with the cleansing of its highest priest. In vision four, we are also seeing there is a progression of the enemy of God's chosen people. We see in the previous chapters, his enemies that surround these evil nations that really troubled Israel and Judah. But now, in this fourth vision, we see the progression of Israel's enemy. Now, we see the real enemy. It is Satan himself, the accuser, as what was mentioned in Job chapter 1. I have only five points in this ten verses. Five, huh? So you have a discount already. Only five points. First point. In this vision, Zechariah saw Joshua, the high priest, standing before God in verse 1. In verse 1, it started, Then he, the interpreting angel, showed me, me is Zechariah, Joshua, the high priest. Joshua, this high priest, this high priest is not the same Joshua that succeeded Moses. Let us make first this. Uh, 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 let us make this first clear. This is not the Joshua during the time of Moses. This is the first high priest of the returning remnant from Babylon. His father was Jehoshadak was a priest taken into captivity in 586 BC. He was the first priest. Returning back to Jerusalem, the remnant of Israel. And Joshua's name in Hebrew means Yehoshua, which means Joshua in English. In Greek, it is Jesus, meaning the Lord saves. The high priest was Israel's primary representative to God. The high priest alone can enter the Holy of Holies once a year during the Day of Atonement the Yom Kippur, celebration of the Jews. And this high priest stand as the representative of Israel from God, before God. He was a symbol of what happens and will happen to the nation. He is the representative of the Israelites before the presence of a holy God. And in this, we see he is standing before the angel of the Lord. You know, in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, if you see it spelled in capital A, this is the Christophany of Jesus Christ. You will never see the name Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, only in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, once you see and the angel of the Lord with the capital A, that is Christ Jesus. So who was standing before the and and, and in the scripture it says, standing before the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is Christ Jesus. And in here, and Satan. Satan literally is the accuser. Standing 
exactly right beside Joshua. If you will see it in your graphic mind, what exactly is happening is right now as if they, the three of them are inside the courtroom. There is a prosecutor, there is a defendant, and there is a judge. We will see it as we go along. And this Satan, he accuses those who sin. If Joshua the high priest were rejected by God, then Israel as a nation would be rejected because the high priest stood before God representing them. So, second point. I told you it would be fast. Zechariah saw the Lord reject Satan's accusations. In verse 2, and the Lord, this is the second person of the Trinity. I put all those uh, 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 open and closed parentheses. And the Lord, the second person of the Trinity, who is Jesus, said to Satan, the Lord, he is talking about the first person of the Trinity, God the Father, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Satan here, like in the courtroom, he was accusing Joshua, the high priest that represents the Israel. And the Lord spoke to Satan, and yet, he distinguishes himself, the Lord distinguishes himself from the Lord in the following phrase. Isn't it how many lords we saw this? And the Lord, that was Jesus, said to Satan, and the Lord, talking about the first person of the Trinity, God the Father. And Satan in here functioned as the prosecutor of Joshua. The prosecutor actually right now here is the one on trial. Not Joshua. Ha! Did you see that? And followed in that verse, the Lord who has chosen the Hebrew people, the continuance of the choice, Jerusalem rebuke you. Wow. That is really powerful. The Lord who has chosen, it is a continuing choice, meaning once God chooses you, it is permanent. Oh boy, I am already shaking here. <laughs> when you got saved, you did not choose Jesus. And you cannot boast in front of Jesus because, Lord, I need to be saved. I need to be in heaven because I choose you. I did not choose any other gods of other religions. I choose you. No. We got saved because God chose you. And that term God chose you, it is a continuing choice. Meaning, once God chose you, once you are safe, it is eternal. Are you still with me? And what was really amazing in that verse is this. When God chose his own people, even they are unclean. Even they were still sinful. God chose them. God chose you. Remember Romans 5 verse 8? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did not require, come on, Alec, I will choose you. But first, wash yourself from your sin. No. God wants only your heart. Trust me. Believe in me. Believe what I did on the cross. I died so that you may live. Do you believe me? You don't need to wash yourself, but just trust me and let me wash you. The gods of this world before they choose you, die for me, and I will give you life. But the God of heaven and earth, the God of Israel, I did not die for him. He died for you. Yes. <sighs> now, three things happen here in this rebuke of the Lord to Satan. Quickly, what are those three things? First, God shuts 
Satan's mouth. Ooh. Second, God redefines who we are. See, in this prosecution of the trial, the trial, not the, the, the now being put in trial is not Joshua, but Satan. God first shut the mouth of Satan. God redefines who we are. And third, God reclothes us. We will see. And in here, in the same passage, is this not a brand blocked from the fire? What does this vision mean? The brown plaque here is a burning stick. This stick is a symbol of the returning remnant who survived the fires of the Babylonian captivity. Israel itself. That time the nation was snatched from the Babylonian exile and God spared the nation from total annihilation. God was not finished with the southern kingdom of Judah just because he sent them to Babylon. God sent them to Babylon for a period of seven years to discipline them so that their hearts will return back to God. What caused them to be captured in Babylon is because they lost their heart for the God of Israel. And God discipline them. Third point. The third scene in this vision was Joshua now being clothed with rich robe. It's getting more exciting. Okay? First, it was the cleansing, God rebuking the devil. And now, Joshua, the high priest, is now being clothed with rich robes. In verse 3, now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. And we talk, when we talk about filthy garments, it talks about fil- that the cloth that Joshua was wearing were covered with excrement. Imagine this. You are facing a holy God and you are wearing a garment covered with feces as if you came from a manhole dunk with feces all over your entire body. This is what the filthy garment is talking about. And this filthy garment is a symbol of how filthy our sins is before the face of a holy God. And Joshua, while having that filthy garment, and was standing before the angel. Joshua stood in the angel of the Lord's court under trial, and he was a repugnancy in the presence of a holy God. Then he, in verse 4, in your monitor you will see, then he, this is the angel of the Lord, the angel of Jehovah, answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, and those are, might, might be those standing here were probably the angels that was there, the angels that was seeing what was happening in this trial court. And in verse 4, the same verse, take away the filthy garments from him, the Lord, the angel of the Lord saying, take away the filthy garments from him. Joshua's acquittal in this verse was symbolized by removing of his filthy garments. In the same verse, verse 4, and to him, Joshua the high priest, he said, see, I have removed your iniquity from you. And this is a formal statement of Joshua's acquittal, an act of God's mercy. Bear with me in this verse 4. Joshua have no capacity. Joshua have no power at all to remove his own filthy 
garment. None of us on this face of the earth can wash or remove your sins before the Holy Lord in heaven. And the only reason that filthy garment, that sin that inhabits us as human here on the face of the earth, you and I have no power. You and I have no capacity to remove it. And the only way to remove that sin is because of the mercy of God. Mercy means God sparing us from what we deserve. You and I deserve only one thing. The moment we were born, and as we grew up, the, the only thing that we deserve is what? All of us deserve to go to hell. And it is only the mercy of the Heavenly Father that spared us going to hell. This is what it means. And in the same passage, and I will clothe you with rich robes. <sighs> Brothers and sisters, remember this, please. Salvation is given to us only by grace. Through faith in God's Son. Through Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2. No other way. You and I can never earn God's salvation. And in the same verse, and I will clothe you, Joshua, with rich robes. How? <gasps> Woo! Priests during those days were to don specially consecrated garments. You know, before the high priest goes to the holy police, they have a lot of ritual. They cannot simply one day just woke up, oh, I just decided to come into the presence of the Lord, to the holy of police, and just, just because I feel it. During those times, no. Only one person on the face of the earth can enter the holy soul, and that is the high priest. And you know what? If the high priest at the time misses one part of the ritual, the cleansing, the purification, and the sacrifices offered before he entered the Holy Folies, you know what will happen to him? He will drop dead. Oh, that's scary. That's why the high priest during that time, you know what they put on their waist? They put a rope with the bells tied on the rope. So just in case the high priest misses the part of the ritual and he falls flat dead in the Holy of Holies, nobody can take him away. So that's why there's a rope. So that he just can simply pull the body out of the Holy of Holies. <sighs> because God is a holy God. But thank God when Jesus Christ died on the cross, you remember that Good Friday? Yeah. What is good about Friday? Jesus died. The veil was torn from top to bottom. Amen. Meaning to those who are in Christ Jesus right now, you can enter to the Holy of Holies because of his grace, because of his mercy. You and I, Become the living temple of God. I don't need to go to Israel anymore. Though I still wish. <laughs> but I don't need to go to the temple in Jerusalem just to experience the presence of God. God's presence is already living inside of me through his Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. That's why come back next Friday. We will talk about the Holy Spirit. Amen. That vision. We can start now. After this. No, Pastor Alan is saying, I can see him saying it. And in verse 5. 
And I, this is now Zechariah, said, let them put a clean turban on his head. See what is happening right now? I'm trying the best I can that you can see this graphically, this vision. Oh, I'm really excited for this vision. In verse 5, see, Zechariah injected himself into the scene by asking that someone put a clean turban on the high priest's head. Zechariah was saying, and I said, let them put. Wow, as if he got that authority, no? In Tagalog, nakisaw-saw pa. <laughs> he tried to inject himself. And what was the meaning of the turban? The turban had a plate of gold on the headdress wrapped with long strips of cloth around the head of the high priest. We can see it in Leviticus chapter 8, verse 9. So, what eventually happened, same in verse 5, so they put a clean turban on his head and they put the clothes on. On him. Clean turban and clothes represented judicial forgiveness. Joshua, you and me, has been cleansed, has been clothed, given a new identity. Not the past renewal. Not the past, Pastor Alan, but a new identity in Christ Jesus. That's why if you have Christ in your heart, you already escaped that court trial. You escape already judgment. And even there will be an accuser. Ha ha! Renner is mine. Satan! But what will happen eventually? The angel of the Lord. Christ himself, standing also right beside me, will stand in between me and Satan. He said, ha, oh, try it. I already died for him. You cannot bring him with you to hell. Give God the glory, church. Give God the glory. Oh, he deserved the highest praise. As if you're not convinced, come on. Oh. The turban was part of the high priest's dress. It had a sign in gold on his headdress that said, Holy to the Lord. And see, it's the same verse in verse 5. And the angel of the Lord stood by. Oh, he did not live, right? He just stood by there, the angel of the Lord standing as an indication of the solemnity of the occasion. The moment you and I are in Christ Jesus, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Whew. And the last point I have, but still I'm still half of the 10 verses, right? I finished already my points, but I'm still only on the last five more verses. Are you still with me? Our five, my five, my, my uh, uh, no, sorry, for fourth point pala, <laughs> it's letter D, my goodness, P, letter E is number five, I'll go back to elementary, Sister Nibi, sorry, I'm still on the fourth point, the fourth part of the Christ vision was the Lord's special charge and promise given to Joshua and through him to the people. In verses 6 to 7 are a charge to the high priest Joshua. And in verses 8 to 10 cover the interpretation of the symbolism of the vision to Joshua. Let's go to verse 6. In verse 6, then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua saying, Joshua, you are charged. And in here, the angel of the Lord charged Joshua, the high priest, to meet two conditions for blessing. And what was the condition given by the angel of the Lord to Joshua to receive these two blessings? This, in verse 7, Thus says the Lord of hosts. The Lord here gave Joshua's recommission after a sinful condition. Joshua now was already acquitted. He is now recommissioning. That's why our, our title is what? Cleanse, 
cloud commission. Now the high priest Joshua is now being recommissioned by the Lord. And the Lord presented two conditions to Joshua. And first is what? The first condition, if you will walk in my ways. Whoa. The first condition. Joshua, if you will walk in my ways. It means he was to personally walk in fellowship with God with all integrity, with all holiness. Joshua needs to live in the way God wants him to live. That's the first condition. So that he will receive the blessings. And the second, when he charged Joshua, and if you will keep my command. Joshua was to perform the priestly duties he's already recommissioned, and he was to be faithful to his role as being a high priest. Then, the same verse, then Joshua, you shall also judge my house. Oh, come on. Oh, boy. When I was studying this, I was trying to dwell the word judge over here. What's the meaning of judge? Let's see first what judge means. It means here. If Joshua met the two conditions of verse 7, then God promised him three blessings. The first, he would serve with authority in the temple. He would protect the temple and he would receive access to God. Judge my house may refer either to the entire nation of Israel or the temple. Joshua would have the privilege to judge the nation regarding issues of truth and morality. This is the purpose of the high priest. Priests decided legal matters pertaining to the temple. And God also said to Joshua in that vision, and likewise have charge of my courts. The second promise to Joshua was that he, he would have responsibility for the temple area. Charge my courts pertains for the, to the protection of the temple the, from idolatry and other defilements. The courts were the temple presence. Joshua would administer the entire temple area. This is the promise. These are the blessings. And the third blessing, he said in the same verse, I will give you places to walk among this. This is the angels around, or the witnesses, the angels around them who stand here. In this third blessing, Joshua would have the privilege to walk among with the angels. Oh, come on. And these were the angels that removed, <laughs> see, see this, and these angels that Joshua will have the privilege to be walking among them are the same angels that removed the filthy garment of Joshua. <sighs> While I was really meditating on this, I was just closing my eyes, bro. <laughs> As if I'm watching in a widescreen what is entirely happening, and this is what I'm trying to impart on you guys. <laughs> Oh, I'm shaking over here. Glory to God. But let me just back as I was preaching this. The term judge. God said, judge my house. What about you and me? You know, in that final day, when Christ Jesus will come back together with us. Did you know what the scripture says? Just now. He will to me. I just I was not able to reach the passage. But the scripture says this. That you and I will also be judging the fallen angels who followed Satan. On that day, we will have the authority to judge those fallen angels, that devil that keeps on bothering you, troubling you here on the face of the earth. It is our high time to see them 
that troubles us. And you and I will be judging them. And last point. The angel of the Lord made a great announcement. God's promised Messiah is coming from verses 8 to 10. Whew. This section, these three verses, 8 to 10, promises the coming of the ultimate high priest. In verse 8, here, when you see the word here in the scripture, it means listen intently. Focus all your attention to me. Give me your ears. Hear, listen, O Joshua, the high priest. You and your companions who sit before you, maybe the companions here and the fellow priests of Joshua, for they are a wondrous sign. The sign here refers to a symbolic depiction of the future event. Ooh. Joshua and his companions were a sign of a new order. And in the same scripture, the same passage, for behold. The word behold calls attention to a crucial message that goes beyond the days of Joshua and his colleagues. For behold. Here's now the climax of this. I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. And in here, three messianic titles are set forth in verses 8 and 9. My servant, the branch, and the stone. Christ the Messiah will be the Father's servant who will come to earth to offer his kingdom in the line of David. The branch was a symbol of a renewed vitality in Israel. This branch was an offshoot of David's line, which would culminate in Christ the Messiah. The branch is related to the first coming of the Messiah. It is a metaphor for the Messiah himself. This term depicts the Messiah as the branch as a branch of David who will fulfill the Davidic covenant. The servant of the heavenly father will come to die, fulfill the father's will while he is here on earth. The branch coming from the lineage of David and the third messianic symbol here is what? The stone in verse 9. And the stone, what will happen, what the stone will do, will judge Gentiles one day in the future. And he will also be a stone of a stumbling to Israel. Do you remember what Psalm 118 verse 22 says? And this is what it says. That stone that the builders rejected has now become the corner stone. Ooh, Hallelujah. And the same stone that prophet Daniel in chapter 2 saw when the image of the tall image of Nebuchadnezzar, which is composed of three kingdoms, right? The gold, the silver, silver and bronze, and bronze and clay. It went down because there was a stone in, coming from heaven that hit the lower portion of the image and completely been destroyed. And who is that stone? It is Jesus Christ that one day he will destroy all the evil things in this world. He is the father's servant. He is the branch from the lineage of David. And he is the stone that once and for all will destroy the kingdom of Satan here 
on earth. Give God the glory, church. He deserves all the glory and praise. And in verse 9, For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua. The stone is used figuratively here of the Messiah who will destroy Gentile powers on this earth. And what is exciting about this, what confirms that this stone is the coming Messiah? See in the same verse, upon the stone are what? Seven eyes. Not pineapple, huh? Pineapple have many eyes. <laughs> Come on, I'm just trying to wake you up. <laughs> upon the stone are seven eyes. And seven is what? A perfect number. And it depicts the Messiah complete omnis- omniscience whereby he will judge. Omniscience, God knows all. God sees all. You can run, but you cannot hide from an omniscient God. And his name is Jesus. Same passage. We're doing it (laughs) sentence by sentence, verse by verse. Are you still with me? Behold, I will engrave each inscription, says the Lord of hosts. And the engraving of inscriptions on cornerstones often bore the name of the builder and the purpose of the building. And I will remove the iniquity of that land in one, what, century? What is written? And one day, the great and glorious day, one day it will come. I'm excited for this, Pastor Jade. Woo! We just worshiped a while ago. <laughs> that is nothing compared to that one day that all of us will worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. The fullness of God will come down in that day. The stone will remove Israel's sin in one day, a single day. This is the day of the second advent, not the rapture. The second coming of Christ Jesus. And last verse, verse 10. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, that day is when God will remove the sins of the nation of Israel, and it is the day of national redemption. Israel will embrace her Messiah one day in the future at the coming of Christ Jesus. Right now, not all Jews worship Jesus Christ. (sighs) But in that day, in that coming day, all Israel will worship Jesus Christ for who he is. And at the time, Jesus will set up a kingdom that reflects his Shekinah glory. Ooh, hallelujah. And in the same verse, last, last sentence in verse 10, everyone will invite his neighbor <laughs> under his vine and under his fig tree. And what is the meaning of this? That day is the millennial kingdom of Christ where all people will rest in peace and prosperity. And what is the principle of this chapter 3, the fourth vision of Zechariah? God will fulfill his purpose for creation of on earth in time through whom? The Messiah. An application? I'm going to close now. <laughs> I'm now already in the application. Pastor Alan and I love application. <laughs> the ultimate purpose for creation is what? For the glory of God. You and I, all creations, will give glory to the Lord God 
to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. And when the Messiah comes, he will set up a kingdom that will demonstrate the glory of God in time on earth. It will take the greatness of the person of Christ to fulfill what first Adam failed at. And after the application, this is my closing. Don't worry, I have only one close. Now I change. <laughs> Khan knows me very well also now. And I want to close this message. Please bear with me. On that fourth vision in Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 to 10, that vision that Zechariah saw, one day, one day, all entire human being, whether dead or alive, will experience the same scenario in that vision that God revealed to Zechariah. Let me repeat that. That vision like in a court trial, all human souls, beings, whether dead or alive, on that one day, all of us will be in that trial court and experience that vision that Zechariah received. And that will be the great day of judgment. Whether you believe in God or not, whether you believe or not on heaven or hell, it doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter. But what will happen is, what will happen, the truth that will happen according to the word of God, that all of us will be judged. And in that trial court, Satan will be there, a sure adversary, a sure accuser or you will be there in the trial court but you will have the advocate <laughs> Satan trying to persecute you right beside you, but also beside you, you have an advocate. You have the Redeemer that will shut the mouth of Satan. Yes. <laughs> Who will cleanse your sin and clothe you with a new robe and giving you a new identity of righteousness in Christ Jesus. If Satan says, Renner, you are mine. Jesus will say, no, you are talking on the wrong person. He is mine. I died for him. And he is going with me in heaven in eternity. Amen. So what will be your choice on that final day? Will you have Satan only beside you? Or you will have the advocate, the redeemer that gives you a new identity and excited to bring you with him in heaven. Give God the glory, church. <laughs> That's why the book of Zechariah, it is a message of repentance, a message of hope, and a message of warning. And I leave this question to you. Will you put your faith in Christ Jesus? Will you trust him? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, You brought this series 
in such a time like this. A wonderful series of sermon, the book of Zechariah, the revelation of the Old Testament to call us to repent, to give us hope and to warn your people. And we thank you for your leading, O oh Lord God, that we are here, a wonderful privilege to hear this wonderful message from a minor prophet. We never know that this will be our series, O oh Lord God, but this is a timely message for your people to hear, to rise up, to wake up, to not be anymore a casual Christian, but a committed, dedicated, and devoted, which you called us to do. No more comfort, no more complacency. And this is our identity in Christ. The life that I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and died for me and rescued me from eternal hell. This is our identity. This is the life, Holy Spirit, help us to live. Dying with Christ, living with Him for that glorious day to be with you eternally, forever in heaven. Heavenly Father, I just pray that this message will echo, echo to the hearts of your people who are here right now and to the every hearts of those people who will hear this message through social media or through, or through YouTube. Because you love them and you choose them. And when you choose them, it is permanent. And our name can never be erased from the Lamb's Book of Life, life in heaven. Because our name is written in the blood of Christ Jesus. Thank you, Holy Father God in heaven. All glory, all honor, and all the highest praise are yours alone. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.